separated by war in brothers. What happened with you and Tommy? I thought you were dead. How does it not even cross your mind that you might want a future with someone? It's simple. You know that moment when you look into somebody's eyes and you can feel them staring into your soul and the whole world goes quiet just for a second? Yes. Right, well, I don't. Did George Clooney lose his soul in baggage claim? I'm A.O. Scott of the New York Times. Hi, Tony. And I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Trivium. Here it is, the comedy for which many are predicting many, many Oscars. It's up in the air. Director Jason Reitman's third feature after Thank You for Smoking and Juno. George Clooney plays Ryan Bingham, an Omaha-based downsizing expert. Basically, he's the guy companies hire to handle layoffs. And here, he passes on a few trade secrets of the perpetual frequent flyer. To know me is to fly with me. This is where I live. When I run my card, the system automatically prompts the desk clerk to greet me with this exact statement. Pleasure to see you again, Mr. Bingham. It's these kinds of systemized, friendly touches that keep my world in orbit. One night in a hotel bar, Bingham meets his match in Alex, played by Vera Farmiga. You'll remember her from The Departed, and she has never been looser or more engaging on screen. I put up pretty pedestrian numbers, like 60,000 a year domestic. It's not bad. You don't patronize me. What's your total? That's a personal question. Oh, please. Well, we hardly know each other. Oh, come on, show some hubris. Come on, impress me. A whiz kid played by Anna Kendrick plans to take the so-called road warriors like Bingham off the road and fire everybody instead by video conferencing. Bingham hates that idea, but he's asked by his boss, played by Jason Bateman, to show her the ropes. Here, Kendrick asks her reluctant mentor why he's intent on racking up all those miles. I'd be the seventh person to do it. More people have walked on the moon. Did they throw you a parade? You get lifetime executive status. You get to meet the chief pilot, Maynard Finch. Wow. And they put your name on the side of a plane. If you guys don't grow up, it's like you need to pee on everything. Reitman and co-writer Sheldon Turner reworked the Walter Kern novel up in the air to connect the story to the current economic downturn. And Reitman puts on camera a parade of actual downsized employees. The film, despite that topical edge, is basically very well-crafted entertainment. I think it's gotten overpraised in some quarters simply because the state of American screen comedy is what it is. But the three leads are terrific fun. The results, almost impossible to dislike, and I say, see it. Well, I'll join the chorus of overpraise, Michael. I think that this is, is a classic in the making. I think 50 or 60 years from now, when people want to know what life was like at this anxious, strange moment mm. of, of, of recession at the, at the end of this decade, they're going to look at this movie the way that we look at the movies of Preston Sturges or Frank Capra to find out what life was like in the 30s we'll and 40s. We'll see if you're right. I just I think that, that, that it captures something very deep, and, and, and in a way very sad about the way that we live now in a lighthearted and comic way. And I think that that's brilliant. Well, look, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the comic style of the playing especially. That's what, that's what I really responded to, especially the second time through. I think Clooney, Vera Farmiga, who never gets a chance to and do this Anna kind of Kendrick. comedy. Oh, my very God. Good, very good. And these are really good roles. I do think the last third, though, is where it doesn't quite fulfill the premise. Well, I, see, I just don't think it's tough enough. That's where I disagree outlook. with you because I think that it, it kind of fools the audience in a very smart way into thinking that it's going to take this kind of glide path toward an easy landing of, of redemption and that this Clooney character is going to see where he's gone wrong and put his life on the right path. And it doesn't quite go there. It goes somewhere a little more disturbing, a little more anxious, but without overdoing well, that yeah. either. I, I think it finds this, a uh, very nice balance. Well, almost. I think it's actually, for me, it's the least of Reitman's for three pictures so really? far. I prefer the, Thank You for Smoking and Juno. Oh, I like this one. I, I think he's really, really hitting his stride, and I think he's going to be one of the one of the great directors well, I, of the I'm next ten there. years. I'm with you okay. there, hopefully. <laughs> next up, we have an early review. Invictus gets its title from a 19th century poem, an inspirational, borderline corny verse about overcoming adversity. It kept Nelson Mandela going during his many years of captivity. The movie, directed by Clint Eastwood, has its corny moments, for sure, but it's also powerful, full of conviction, and one of the most inspiring movies of the year. I know all of the things they denied us, but this is no time to celebrate petty revenge. This is the time to build our nation. 
Okay. Mandela is played with quiet mastery and a sly twinkle by Morgan Freeman. Newly elected South Africa's first black president in 1994, Mandela finds himself in charge of a divided nation, and he hits upon an unlikely strategy for reconciliation. He'll unite the country behind the national rugby team, the Springboks, a symbol of pride for the Afrikaner minority, and for most black South Africans, an emblem of the hated apartheid system that kept them down for so many years. Do you hear? Listen to your country. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Defense, defense, defense. This is it. This is our destiny. Matt Damon plays Francois Pina, captain of the Springboks, and the alliance that he and Mandela form is at the heart of Invictus. We need inspiration, Francois. Because in order to build our nation, we must all exceed our own expectations. In some ways, this is a simple, rousing story of athletic triumph, but it's also a complex study in political leadership. Eastwood's blunt, straightforward style is also more subtle than it seems at first. This picture is viscerally satisfying, but it also gives you a lot to think about afterwards. By all means, see it. I should also say, Matt Damon, I think, is, is fantastic. Very good. He's, he's really one of our most reliable actors, I think. Yeah. And, and I, I agree. I say see it. I think it's, Eastwood's, it's one of Eastwood's good ones. Now, I'm, I'm a little worried that you're slightly misleading people with the whole viscerally exciting thing, because for my money, the picture's more contemplative and a little cooler and a little more relaxed than that. It doesn't have the usual kind of screw tightening that a typical sports movie would have. What I liked about it, though, is it's very sharp about laying out the political complexity yes. and why Mandela is doing right. what he's doing. And just to spend the time he does with his security detail and all the yeah. different yeah. points of view, the white Afrikaners, the black South Africans, very interesting well, mixture a, a of lot characters. Well, a lot of different sort of subplots. And what I mean by viscerally satisfying, I guess, is not so much the sports stuff. I yeah. mean, I still don't understand the game of rugby. <laughs> um, although this is the best rugby movie, certainly, that I've ever seen. But, you know, th there, there's a point at the end when, when they all stand up and sing the national a anthem. And the Afrikaans... Um, players are, are singing the African, you know, what they call the, the terrorist song of, yes, the, of yes. the AMC. Yes, yes, good and, and, and I teared. It was like watching the Marseillaise scene in, in Casablanca. Uh, I yeah. was just, you know, my heart was so full. And then when, when Damon's character goes to visit Robben Island, where Mandela was imprisoned for 27 years, that is just a beautiful moment. And they moment. don't overhype that scene. Exactly. Damon beautifully played. I also think the thing I was worried about going into this is that it would tell basically a, a story of black South Africa through completely right. white perspectives. It's not, it's not the case. It's very well balanced, satisfying. Coming up next, they won't come home, so Robert De Niro hits the road to see his ungrateful kids in Everybody's Fine. And later, two brothers, one woman, one war. We'll review Jake Gyllenhaal, Tobey Maguire, and Natalie Portman in Brothers. You gonna shoot me? I don't know what it is with you kids. You always told your mother everything. You never told me anything. You're always on the phone with her. We could just talk to mom. Oh, but you couldn't talk to me? Well, she was a good listener. You were a good talker. Well, so that's good. We made a good team. When was the last time we saw Robert De Niro give a good lead performance in a movie that basically worked? Too long. Everybody's Fine is about a recent widower and retired factory worker named Frank, played by De Niro, who feels like it's time to get his far-flung kids together again around the same table with a nice bottle of wine, no, say. I, I, I just want to get some expensive bottles of wine for my children. This isn't for children. Uh, I know it's not for children. It's for my children that aren't children anymore. One by one, Frank's children cancel on the reunion for variously fishy reasons, so he decides to pay them all surprise visits, one city at a time. His artist son, living in Manhattan, is nowhere to be found, so Frank heads west to Chicago to visit Amy, played by Kate Beckinsale. I thought that I would stay a day or two. Oh, that would have been so great. I this week's really difficult. I feel awful. I got this huge pitch to oversee at the agency, and I, we should arrange it properly another time. From there, it's off to Denver to visit oh, yeah. musician Robert, yeah, played by Sam Rockwell. I'm getting the whole family together. Amy's going to call you. But if not, if she forgets, you call her, and you stay in touch with each other. I will. I will. And you're happy. Happy, yeah. I get paid to bang a big loud drum all day. Of course I'm happy. Drew Barrymore plays Frank's other daughter in Vegas, and like her siblings, she's hiding something from Dad. While writer-director Kirk Jones offers few surprises in this film, the actors transcend the contrivances 
And it's very satisfying, I think, to see De Niro relax on screen this way. So for De Niro especially, I say see it. And Tony, this is a remake of an Italian picture, yes. which I didn't like at all. This well, is, for me, a lot better. Oh, see, I didn't like either one. And I say <laughs> skip this one. I mean, I don't think that the acting transcends the contrivances. I think hmm. these are good actors, and I think that, you know, De Niro is, is unparalleled when it comes to burrowing into a, to an emotionally repressed Just character and kind of showing him from the inside out. Right. But I didn't feel like I was watching characters who were related to each other. Every scene they were in, I felt like I was watching movie stars meeting each other for the first time. I could not picture them all growing up in the same I house mean, together I, uh, and turning into what, they're, what they've supposedly it's, become. It's, it's formulaic. I, don't, I do not argue that, I think, but I think you're getting much better acting. Form no, I mean, you're getting much better acting than you're giving it credit for between De Niro and especially Sam Rockwell. I mean, those are two very interesting, simpatico actors coming at it. I, I just think, you know, for the acting alone, it's worth seeing. Modest, worth seeing. No, but I, th I think that actually the movie squanders the talents of the actors. I, 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 I think the opposite. I think it just sort of strands them in this kind of diagram of relationships and doesn't let them actually explore all right, well, hold on. Tell me when De Niro has played a part remotely like this, honestly. I think he plays this kind of character all the time. I think he plays this kind of character in like a terrible movie like, you know, Flawless with Philip Seymour Hoffman. <laughs> well, that's not even worth talking about. No. <laughs> well, then let's not. <laughs> For De Niro alone, it's a small picture, but it's worth seeing. Coming up next, two Oscar-winning movies about musicians make our lists for the top ten movies of the decade. And on next week's show, Mark Wahlberg and Rachel Weisz star in Peter Jackson's The Lovely Bones. Plus, the latest from Walt Disney Animation, The Princess and the Frog. Hunker up, buttercup. We're continuing our countdown of the top ten movies of the decade. So far, my favorites have been Directorial Tours de Force, Minority Report, Gosford Park, Mulholland Drive, United 93, Zodiac, and E2 Mama Tambien. My number four pick is Once. It's much more unassuming, and the man who made it has described it as a video album about a Dublin street musician and a flower seller destined to harmonize, however fleetingly. Sounds like a nothing, right? Wrong. I love how writer-director John Carney's film takes the oldest cliches in the book and makes them sing, as in this scene, where Glenn Hansard and Marquetta Erglova sit down at a music store to find out if they're compatible. Take this That song, Falling Slowly, won an Oscar. Is the movie important? Significant? No. Is it lasting? I think so. Forget the absurd R rating. If your kid or anyone you know is at all interested in music, friendship, a story about two good people trying to do the right thing by their hearts, show them this movie. It is fantastic, I think. What do you think, Tony Scott? Um, I think it's pretty good. Wow. <laughs> no, ringing, I, ringing endorsement. Good, sorry. Good, 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 good. I, I enjoyed it. I think it's charming. I like the two of them. I like the sort of the feel and the looseness and the scruffiness of this movie. The thing that got in my way that didn't let me connect to it the right. way that you and so many people did. People adore this yeah, movie. Yeah, they love it. They is love that them. I just don't really like the music all that much. That kind of like, you know, bellowing while you're, you're banging on your acoustic guitar, it just doesn't really I know you tried me. that professionally for a while. It didn't work out. I think you're bitter. No. Yeah, it's my, it's, it's my own favorite. Failure as a busker. <laughs> so far, my picks are Million Dollar Baby, 25th Hour, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days, The Best of Youth, and Where the Wild Things Are. My number four pick is Roman Polanski's The Pianist. There have been a lot of movies about the Holocaust over the past ten years, maybe too many. It's become an easy route to seriousness and sentiment, but this one's different. The Pianist is based on the memoir of Vladislav Spielmann, a Jewish musician played by Adrian Brody, whose comfortable world is destroyed by the Nazis. Polanski has always been a master of claustrophobic terror, never more so than in the scenes when Spielmann, hiding in an empty apartment, watches the war from his windows. Now, Roman Polanski has been in the news a lot lately because of a rape he committed in the 1970s, and I don't believe that his art in any way mitigates his guilt. But I also don't think that the crime diminishes the art, and The Pianist is a great movie, precise, unsparing, and focused on the absurdity and horror of a period in history that still escapes comprehension. Tony, in the face of the pianist, I have to retract my pick for once because it is so puny <laughs> compared to compared to Polanski's achievement, which is really fantastic. I mean, I, for me, it's a more essential 
and really more piercing film than Schindler's List. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I just I just think he's showing you something in a way that really speaks and shows the unspeakable and the unsure. And, and it's personal. I mean, he did he did live through that, you know, as 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 a child in Poland, um, and and it has some of the authority of personal experience and this this keen intelligence and, and insight. And not a speck of sentiment. Not at all. Both The Pianist and Once are currently available on DVD. And we've got a host of extras on our website. You can submit your pick for the best movie of the decade. More than 15,000 of you already have. And we'll also be answering some of the hundreds of viewer questions we've gotten. Thank you. In our web exclusives section. Also, there's a brand new feature called The Director's Corner, where directors like Up in the Air's Jason Reitman and Harold Ramis talk about some of their favorite movies of all time. Coming up next, Tobey Maguire, Jake Gyllenhaal, and Natalie Portman struggle with the consequences of war in Brothers. That's my brother. I cut my throat to bring him back. I don't know what he's gonna do. What's going on in your head? You're my brother. You gotta tell me. Did you sleep with her? Sam. Our next movie is Brothers, with Tobey Maguire and Jake Gyllenhaal as siblings on very different paths. Gyllenhaal's Tommy is the black sheep of the family, home from a stint in prison, just in time to say goodbye to his brother Sam, that's Maguire, a Marine heading off for another tour of duty in Afghanistan, where he's apparently killed in action. Sam's dead. What are you, what are you talking about? He's dead, Tommy. Come in. Why didn't you call me? Natalie Portman is Grace, Sam's wife. He also leaves behind two young daughters and a hard-drinking, leathery father, also a Marine, played by Sam Shepard. After the funeral, Dad makes it pretty clear to Tommy that he thinks the wrong son survived. Did you hear those Marines in there today talking about your brother? Did you? Who is going to stand up and testify for you once you're dead? But it turns out that Sam did survive, tell me living through a horrific ordeal and coming home an angry, jealous, and tormented what man. Happened? And he doesn't like Tommy's kitchen renovations either. You know what I did to get back to you? No. You know what I did? The f There's a lot of strong emotion here and some pretty good acting, especially from Gyllenhaal and Portman and the two little girls playing her daughters. But Brothers, director Jim Sheridan's remake of a Danish film, is not specific enough about its characters to achieve the kind of realism it's aiming for. There's a film in theaters now called The Messenger that I think does a much better job of tackling the grim, important issue of how modern war affects soldiers and their families. It's definitely worth seeing. But Brothers, just on the strength of the acting, is one you can rent. No, oh, no, it's better than that, Tony. You can see it. I say see it. This is the best Tobey Maguire and Jake Gyllenhaal have been on screen for me. It's the most piercing and the most honest acting they've done. And they have to deliver some big fireworks, and none of it gets phony or melodramatic. I, I think I you're think right. Quite about, a lot of it no, gets no, no, phony. No, no, You're right and about the messenger. That's well worth seeing too. This is in a different key. I think Jim Sheridan is going for a very kind of tightly packed, compressed melodrama, but it does not play false. And I think scenes between Sam Shepard and his sons. I mean, that's and, and Mayor no, Winningham, who's wonderful, never gets used. Very good acting. No, well, I, I think the acting is good, but again, as with everybody's fine, and, and this is a better movie than that. Um, although you know, you, you seem to like them both. It, seems more like the characters are sort of working out a scheme and a diagram than actually living and expressing what what they're supposed to be. So I just felt that the relationships between the two brothers, you know, the black sheep, the white sheep, the dad, who's the, the kind of, you know... But he's um, not a cliché. No, he, not the way Shepard plays a, him. And not the way he's I'm written. sorry. No. He's a walking, talking, hard-drinking no, cliché like, all I, the way. No, no. You're, it's like you saw a different actor play him. Shepard does not play it that way at all. And I don't even think it's written that way. No, very strong stuff. I say, see it. Coming up next, for my money, this is a great week at the movies, and I'll tell you the three you shouldn't miss in my three to see. Closed captioning for At the Movies is sponsored by... Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. My three to see this week features movies that were all on this week's show. What do you know? I think it's a strong week for the movies. Tony disagrees with me on two of them, erroneously. But number three, Everybody's Fine, starring Robert De Niro as a widower who goes on a road trip to find out how his kids are really doing. I wouldn't call it unpredictable, but I found it a satisfying and well-acted heartwarming. Number two, Up in the Air. This, of course, is the Oscar bait for the week. George Clooney 
Vera Farmiga and Anna Kendrick, excellent all of them. The trading banter and talking downsizing in Jason Wrighton's smoothly crafted romantic comedy. And at number one to see this weekend, Brothers. Just when you think you've seen enough movies about Americans at war and what can happen after they come home, along comes a surprisingly good one. Well, you're one for three, and if you were a baseball player, that'd be a pretty good average. Oh, That's harsh. it for now. We'll leave you with a recap of this week's show. Join us next week when we'll continue to count down the top ten movies of the decade. Plus, we'll review Mark Wahlberg in Peter Jackson's The Lovely Bones and Disney's The Princess and the Frog. And until then, we'll be at the movies. to the future are buried in the past. Going back! Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince by the Blu-ray Combo Pack Tuesday. Activon Ultra Strength for powerful pain relief. A convenient applicator means no messy creams. Activon, applied directly where it hurts for joint pain, muscle pain, arthritis, and backache. Treat yourself to holiday hotcakes at IHOP with gingerbread, eggnog, or pecan pie pancakes. IHOP, come hungry, leave happy, and treat someone special with a gift card. Your pets need year-round protection, plus medications for cold weather joint pain. Fortunately, they cost a lot less at 1-800-PETMEDS. Call now or order online.